Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Vitality Coaches Wellbeing Programme. My name is Jamie, and I am part of the coaches team um, where my role is head of health engagement. And today, our topic of conversation is all about immunity and how to look after your immune system during the tougher winter months. So our immune system is the first line of defense against um, things like infection and disease. Therefore, I'm sure the idea of boosting your immunity is pretty enticing to a lot of people, but the reality is maybe that it's not quite as easily accessible as that. So what we do know, though, that there are various factors which can have an impact on how our immune system functions and whether it's functioning optimally or suboptimally. And these sorts of things include like nutrition, um, exercise, stress, sleep, all things I'm sure that you've heard of before. But what we'll do today is hopefully provide a little bit more context around how that affects your immunity and what you can do to support them as well. So given our topic today, fortunately, I'm not the expert, but we are joined by two really special guests who will guide us through the various facts and myths to give us a better understanding of how to improve and support our own health and well-being. So firstly, we have our resident uh, vitality performance champion and nutritionist, James Hudson. So James is a former professional rugby player for several Premiership rugby clubs, um, including Gloucester, where he's now sports scientist. And James is also just coming to the end of studying his PhD. So we're in very safe hands there with nutrition. Um, and alongside James, we also have Vitality Performance Champion, Emma Wiggs, MBE. Um, Emma has a really ridiculously impressive CV. Um, I know for a fact that she's the double Olympic champion, I think double European champion, and I think 10 times world champion. But Emma, I didn't check this with you before. Is that still correct? uh yes okay good still <laughs> 10 i didn't know if there's any more every time i see there seems to be more um no no we're, but... we're deep in winter training so it's no okay, no racing fine. at the minute <laughs> i can't keep up with you um but it's it's great to both have you here um i think that i feel now very comfortable that we are in extremely safe hands so james you're going to kind of guide us through this and then emma's going to kind of offer her input into what she does at the moment and how she keeps being that consummate professional that she is so i'm going to pop up some slides and I'll pass over to you to take us through. Brilliant, thanks Jamie, and hello to everybody who's joined us. And hi Emma, great to see you. Um, yes, we're gonna tackle this big subject of immune health, obviously timely with the winter months upon us now. And I think what we're gonna try and do is transfer some of the tips and skills that we would work with athletes uh, around their immune systems during heavy training and make it applicable to the everyday athlete because those of us out there who are braving those cold winter conditions and getting out on the road clocking up some miles or still sticking to it and getting into the gym we need to think about some of these factors to try and promote our well-being during these winter months so Jamie if we just flick onto the first slide the way that I would think about it and I when I address any athletes and I think this completely applies to everyday athletes as well is that if we, if we eat the right things in the lead up to a training session or a match or on a game day, we can perform. But what we want to do is we want to be healthy enough that we can perform every single day. And I suppose, Emma, at the moment, you're in a heavy winter training period. How do you approach your immune health during these winter months? How do you, how do you focus on it and yeah. go about it? I think, I think it's a bit brutal, to be honest, in the winter. So as a canoeist, you know, we, we do spend a bit more time in the gym in the winter, but equally we're still on the water. So it's really, really important for us to be looking at our diet, our nutrition, trying to do a kind of food first approach, but actually supplementing those crucial extras that will help with our immunity. I think the English Institute of Sport, who we work really closely with, did a study in about 2015 for two years that found that in the, all of the athletes that are part of the world class programme in the UK, 5,800 days of training were lost due to upper respiratory infections, which when you, that blows my mind, that's 16 years of, of, of training wow. in a two, in a two year period. So, you know, for us, it's about maximizing our immunity to allow us to, to get the hard work done. You know, we don't want to be missing days or sessions. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. I love that mentality because, and as well, the science tells us that those athletes which win the medals, like yourself, are on the podium at the at the major championships. They're the ones who miss the fewest days. So having that mentality about maximising every single day, and I think that's definitely something that everyone can take away. If we want to be the best version of ourselves every day, realising how we can yeah. uh, improve and, and, re and reduce our risk is definitely a way to go about yeah. it. Absolutely, because I feel like people don't, it's horrible having a, a bug or a cold, isn't it? So why mm. wouldn't we try and do everything we can to prevent it? And I think in a way, that's one of the 
the pluses, if you can call it a plus, off the back of COVID is maybe we're all a bit more aware of simple things like hand hygiene and things that we could do to keep us a bit safer because it's miserable having a cold or or being poorly for, for anybody so the mm. more we can do the better so this is really exciting to listen to this yeah brilliant so jamie if we just pop on to the, the next slide so the way i like to look at it and this is this is not my this is not my thought process i have to pay homage to uh, professor neil walsh at liverpool john Moores university who has come up with this fantastic new paradigm if you like and way of thinking over the last few years and the way in which he likes to propose it and he's one of the most the most prominent researchers in immune health with athletes is that there are certain things that we can do to be resistant so to actually promote our immune systems to work effectively to be resistant to getting sick and there are also things that, let's face it, we're going to get exposed to bugs, bacteria and viruses, but we also need to be tolerant. So we need to be able to tolerate being exposed to those things as well. So those two things working in tandem can give us, we fight on the two fronts, as I'd say, it can give us the best chances of one, not picking up bugs in the first place, but also realising that when we are exposed, we feel the effects of it minimally. So the resistance side of things we'll, we'll cover off first, but they cover things, simple things around our hydration, our sleep, our hygiene, lots of things which Emma's mentioned. But then also we can look at the ways in which we can tolerate things, which will include a few supplements and foods, foods that we'll talk about that we can include in our diets and look after ourselves to make sure that when we do get exposed, any symptoms are very short lived and we're back to 100 percent of functioning straight away. So how do you, Emma, when you're, when you're through the year, how do you think about your, your hydration through, the, through training? So obviously it's cold and, and, and you know, you're in the gym quite a lot at the moment, but you're still on the water. How does that affect how you, how you hydrate? Yeah, I think hopefully people listening will, will be able to relate that it's, it's much easier in the summer right to be drinking to be drinking loads when the weather's warmer and and you feel like you're thirsty and i think in the winter particularly like i've just done a session out there today and it's i think it's minus two feels like temperature and you don't you don't you don't particularly want to be swigging from a from a from a cold bottle um at that point so i i'm a bit of a geek and i just make sure that i i know my measurements so i have a, a water bottle that i use consistently um and i i make sure that i've had at least three of those across the training day um, and then again in the evening. Brilliant. That is awesome because it brings me on nicely, absolutely perfectly, to talking around this and your model student straight away. So, Jamie, if you just pop on to the next one. So the importance around our hydration is that it is our first line of defence. So if we're hydrated, we have plenty of but mucus which lines our nose our throat and actually our stomach as well and if we're well hydrated we've got that first line of defense which catches any bacteria and bugs that we're breathing in and then our immune system can act upon those shortly before they become into they get into our system so when we're thinking about how much fluid we're drinking i think you're, emma you're absolutely right during the winter months we tend to and i'm guessing you would have spent a lot of time on the water wearing several layers today <laughs> is that is that we wrap up we wrap up warm and people don't quite have the same thirst mechanism, but they also don't realize how much they're sweating. They come off and they might think, actually, you know what? I don't feel particularly sweaty there, quite like I would do in the summer months. But actually, because it's evaporating so quickly, we are still sweating a huge amount when we're exercising, but we don't have quite the same mechanisms to do that. So you talk about your three bottles. Jamie, if you just pop onto the next slide, Read my mind. If we if we think <laughs> about how much if we think about how much fluid we've got to get in, again, this gets a little bit technical, but it will make sense. Is around about thirty mil per kilo of body weight is a sort of baseline for a day. So a seventy kilogram person would be just over two liters of fluid. So you know, two and a bit big big liter water bottles, or it could be some of the smaller you know half liters pints would be about um, four pints of water over the course of the day. But again, that can come from anywhere. So it can come from other fluids that we drink. It could come from milk or or water in our cereal or, the, or our porridge in the morning. It could come from fruit juice, fruits as well. But the big thing is how much we lose. So as Emma said, you know, when she loses a lot of fluid whilst on the water or in the gym training, she's replacing that as she goes. So again, starting the day with good habits. It's how do you, do you tend to have a sort of program to start the day each morning? Yeah, I, absolutely. I just make sure that I've got, you mean in terms of hydration or in terms of food? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hydration yeah. to go with your morning. Yeah. So yeah. I, I always start, I start the morning, you know, I would love to start it straight away with a cup of tea, but I make sure that I have a, um, I guess it's about, I don't know, 500 mils of, of hot water with lemon, first of all, and then I will have a cup of tea um, as well. And I'll already have my bottles filled up ready to be sipping on the way to training as I've got about a 20 minute commute so it starts yeah from when I wake up just trying to get that fluid in 
Yeah, I think that's an awesome habit. And that's something I definitely push with all the athletes I'm lucky enough to work with is if you start with water and you get that first sort of 400 to 500 mils in, when you have that cup of tea, that coffee, you're not just quenching your thirst with that and you're more likely to then keep drinking and sipping away. Whereas if you start the day straight away with a, a smaller drink, you often only drink half the volume you would do and you quenched your thirst and you're straight up, you're straight, straight in the car and you're straight onto training. So if you're training in the morning or in the evening, a big tip I would say all the way through the winter months as well as the summer, but try and start the day with some fluid straight away. And then think about how much how much body mass you might lose as well. So again, this is a little bit more technical. So for the real hardcore everyday athletes who are in there, maybe clocking up some miles ready for the summer competitive season, if you're a runner or a cyclist, just have a little look about how much weight you're losing. Because if you get off the bike or you come in from a run or you get off the treadmill at this time of year and you've lost you know, a couple of kilos in body weight, that can equate to sort of two to three litres worth of fluid. And again, that's quite a big deficit to, to try and make up, which again, we need to add that onto that baseline amount that we might start the day with. So you haven't got to drink that straight away. It's not about, you know, chopping, <laughs> chopping another two bottles of fluid. It's just about increasing how much you drink over those next few hours and before you next do some exercise through the day. But that's definitely a good marker to use in terms of your hydration. James, I think we've definitely got the, the right guest here. Emma's just like the perfect model. Pro. Yeah. I'm, uh... No, I'm feeling I'm feeling like I'm like I'm a bit of a geek and I feel like I need to say that I do something wrong in a minute. Just to... No, not at I all. I think it's admirable. We've also had a lot of pre-registered questions, which I'm gonna bring in throughout, and one of them was actually about the cooler temperatures and training. And someone said a bit like your point earlier, and I can definitely relate to this, and I'm not sure of the answer. I when you're training in winter outside and you wrap up warmer, you don't feel the sweat like you do, like you say in summer. D does the cooler air temperature mean that you will sweat less though? Or should you actually be like looking at really similar levels of rehydration post a, a, an equivalent training session? Um, I think they might be slightly less just because of, of the temperature. But again, if you've wrapped up and you've got plenty of layers on, yeah. that is also going to have an effect. And actually it has a little bit of an effect. And we'll talk about this in a, in a moment, but it leads nicely into it. it does have a little bit of an effect if you're training for a long time, very cold temperatures on, on how much fuel you get through. So you will get through those fuel stores in your muscles quite quickly compared with, um, if, with warmer temperatures. But again, I think it's just about having that little bit of recognition of actually, you know what I have, I have lost this much volume in, in body weight and that relates to how much sweat I've lost. So obviously taking off your, your sweaty clothes after you've, after you've finished the session, you don't have to do it all the time, but it's just quite a good way of just checking in and thinking, oh, actually, you know what? I have still lost a couple of kilos in that long run I've done at the weekend. So that does mean I still need to replenish with that because like you say, because of the cold, our thirst signals might not be quite the same. So it doesn't break. We don't recognize quite the same loss of fluid and that can be a bit detrimental in that recovery period after training for how we fuel and rehydrate. Amazing. I think that might lead us on to your next sections. Brilliant. So the other thing that can make us really resistant is sleep. And I'm not going to go into massive detail because we've talked about this before. And I think it's something which in a good way is very present on, on platforms and information. But what do you find ever in the winter? How do you find your sleep gets affected by really heavy training periods? Yeah, I think for me, I don't know whether it's a para athlete thing, but in a in a really heavy block, I can have a bit more neural um, pain, neural symptoms like that. So that can often be in the winter when we, our training loads are much, much higher and that can impact on sleep. So I made a decision about two or three years ago to completely move my bedtime. So I don't know whether this is this is any good, James, you can tell me, but I moved my bedtime to eight o'clock which I realise people with proper lives um, can't always do. But it doesn't necessarily mean I'm asleep by eight o'clock, but I am in bed, um, horizontal, starting that kind of process of, of getting ready for sleep. And I found it made, a, it made a massive difference. So, you know, I do all the things that you're supposed to do about, you know, not you know, watching telly in bed and all the rest of it. But I found the biggest thing for me was, was that physically being, being horizontal, um, was preparing me really well. And I also um, bought a weighted blanket. I don't know what your thoughts are on those um, because I found that that's been really helpful from a, not just even a sleep point of view, from an anxiety point of view and and just a kind of stress relieving. And I found my sleep quality was was better with that when I looked at the numbers. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what I do. I don't know if it's it's got any science yeah. behind it. 
No, fantastic. That is no again model model student in terms of model athlete because that's that's the whole the whole process of, of getting relax relaxation into your routine prior to bed is so important and I think so many of us again I, you know I've talked about this in different sessions but so many of us have this cutoff point where we realise it's almost too late but it's time to go to bed and it's suddenly that transition becomes a blur and and we don't get the time to actually wind down so finding a way of like you say neurally and our nervous systems actually actually relaxing getting into whether it's doing breathing exercises whether it's having a warm shower whether it's doing some stretching whether it's just like you say switching off from all those blue light those disruptors and getting ourselves ready to sleep and giving that the time it needs to then lead into quality sleep is just so important because let's face it in the winter it's dark <laughs> it's going to be yeah. cool unless you unless you've got the bedroom too hot it's going to be quite cool as well so your environment to sleep you're under really in a really good position to control during the winter months so doing those relaxation routines and finding what works for you is so important to doing that. And again, coffee, tea, disruptors like alcohol, if we can limit those in the, in the, as much as we can, coffee and caf high caffeine drinks, we can limit those onwards from, you know, just after the middle of the day, that's going to have a big impact in how we can get to sleep as well. But the reason why I talk about sleep is because some brilliant research. And actually, if we consistently get less than seven hours, our chances of picking up colds are three times as great. So it's a huge shift. As soon as our sleep is restricted to below seven hours regularly, our chances, it's almost inevitable that we're going to pick up colds and, and bugs like that. So again, not just an athletic population, but all of us, if we can devote that time to preparing to sleep and then getting quality sleep, it's going to pay dividends with how resistant we are to picking up bugs. So it's, it has a huge impact on what we can do. James, this is a fascinating insight into both what you should do, but also what Emma's life is like as well. It's, it's I know, it's so, so dull. Literally, I, no, I, I'm, it's I'm, not, not. I'm not selling myself as very interesting. No, you are. You are. You are. I think it's... it's I would it's love so to be incredible. in bed at 8 o'clock. I yeah. just think, I just think, you know, I'm, uh, I found such a difference to how I could train the next day yeah. and even how I woke up by, by moving it. And I don't think, you know, when I actually looked at what was I doing between 8 and 10, not very much. So why didn't mm. I just make that move and and the difference in how i woke up was just huge so yeah. emma do you know keeping what the... those times consistent as well is so important because if you keep the time consistent you, you you'll get that habitual process of, of relaxation yeah. and sleep as well so you, you i do really get laughed at i get laughed at a lot by my no. teammates but... well you own it do you know what the key to a good morning is oh no tell me it's the night before so there know, we go. There we go. How's that one? That's your answer now. <laughs> James, just, just digging into the science a tiny bit on this, because again, lots of people yeah. have asked about sleep. Um, what is it about what's happening in the body during the sleep that helps with the, your immune factor? Is it just your cells and your body's ability to work closer to optimal? And the reason why I frame it in that way is because so many people have asked the question about boosting your immunity. And I think that's a bit of a myth in terms of you can't boost it, but everything can work to its optimal level. So is that why the sleep part is so important? Yeah, again, I'm not I'm not a sleep expert, but my understanding is that during during the nighttime period where we get the restorative sleep that we need, our immune system has the chance, and generally different areas of metabolism across the night, but our immune system has the opportunity to actually create all the cells, those, those, those mm. different immune cells that they need to then fight off fight off disease and bacteria and viruses when it's called upon. If we don't get enough sleep, then it won't actually have the time to, to regenerate and be prepared for the next onslaught, if you like. So I think it's it's definitely it's definitely the period of the day where our body gets to catch up. It gets to restock the shelves, gets ready for the next day. And if we give it the time, then it will provide what we need. But if we do cut that short, we're going to be in, undoing ourselves really in terms of the opportunity. Amazing. I think that's why obviously time and quality are so important. Yeah. And I mean, hygiene is a really slightly obvious one. And I think like Emma said exactly before is that probably COVID Im impacted us quite well in terms of our habits and our understanding the importance of it. But again, basic hygiene skills, just lowering our exposure to sick people and also simple things, washing hands, using hand gels, all these things. They're almost a hangover of a pandemic, which shouldn't really go away and that we should still use that. And I mean, I don't know about you, Emma, but how do you find, do you find just managing your your daily interactions as well? Do you find that you you still have that that view yeah. on things? Yeah, and I, and I still hand gel all the time. I think it, <laughs> I found it quite shocking that for 40 years of my life, I never realized, <laughs> I, I never considered how disgusting a petrol pump pump mm. is and then the covid comes along and we're all hand gelling and wearing gloves and i'm and i'm thinking wow i've, ne I've never thought how disgusting that could be 
yeah. and how many germs could be on that. So yeah, I think I'm I'm at quite the extreme end of the spectrum. So still loving hand gel, um, wearing masks in crowded spaces, and 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 but basically not to be some kind of nerd, just to be just to be well, because I just feel like the 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 a positive out of the pandemic is that a, a learning about I can actually play some part in my own immunity and uh, and if that means hand gelling and wearing a mask why wouldn't I do that to stay well yeah exactly I think it's just I think the big the big tip I would just give is just still being good habits with it it's not something that we should ignore and again you can't underestimate the impact because if you're not exposed to these things then it's you're not going to have to have to tolerate them so being resistant the first port of call is just in understanding your exposure and how you can look after that yourself and take ownership of it I think that's really key uh, and then if we if we crack on then to the good bit, how we fuel. I think this is it. And we get into food. This is where we can, we can talk about fun things. But but I mean, the, the, the really important thing is, is that our energy that we have in our meals every day is crucial for our immune system function. So, I mean, I don't know about you, Emma, but what are your what are your go to recovery high, you know, your high fuel meals that you'll have after training? What are your favorites at the moment? Well, I've got a new hashtag, uh, James, and it's carbs, carbs till Christmas. Um, so it's, um, I, I, I feel like I've, I've had a weird relationship with carbs. I think being a wheelchair user, I've always been a bit conscious of, of being careful with carbs. And then as an athlete, I was still had that kind of hesitation. So, you know, it took me a few years to understand the value of them and, and, and where to put them and what to have. And when I embraced carbs, I made huge gains in the gym. I was actually leaner because I was fueling my body better. I wasn't as ill. And probably more importantly, I was much nicer to be around. <laughs> so, so I feel like, um, you know, my go to is I, I love porridge. I love rice pudding. Um, all of those things that are quite like I think the other day, it was the end of the week and I just had a, a banana almond butter wrap just literally all nice. smashed and squidged in. Nice. Um, and it was, it was just amazing. And I was thinking like, you know, that's one way of saying winter training without saying winter, tra winter training. Um, so really important. Yeah, precisely. That's, I love that. I think, and like you say, you have that kind of slight aha moment as an athlete when you understand quite how powerful fueling your training is properly. And I think it's something, Jamie, we've talked about before with with the everyday athletes who tune into these these sessions. And the reason why I hammer this home is that our immune systems require that energy to function well. So our response to any infection and our, our body's ability to respond quickly, swiftly and effectively requires energy. And, and essentially that window after training sessions, we're particularly vulnerable. So if we've done a really high intensity session, so this doesn't apply to every single training session, but when we've gone and really worked hard, you know, our score out of 10 for the session is, is up there at six, seven, eight is, we need to refuel our energy stores in our muscles, but also we need to provide the required energy for our immune systems to take on any onslaught of these bugs and bacteria that we're going to be vulnerable to in that in those first few hours after a big event or a big training session. So don't underestimate the ability of not just refueling your muscles after a session, but when you've done something particularly challenging, that fuel has a really dual aspect, especially in these winter months. So don't underestimate the importance of doing that. Delaying it by too long, and you, if your body doesn't have the right fuel to there to, to fight off these bugs and bacteria, then you're leaving yourself a little bit open to that. So yeah. thinking about your meals in the day, what you can have, you know, a banana wrap with, with peanut butter and honey sounds amazing. <laughs> but, amazing. But, but again, it, it might not be necessarily having lots and lots of really sugary foods, but just really good quality fruit yeah. and veg, starch, starchy vegetables, rice, your pastas, you know, really, really focusing on those meals around those sessions afterwards can be a big benefit to us in the winter months as well. And I think for some people, James, I want to share, because just because it's about immunity, a really quick, a really quick story. So my mum is 70 and is very active, probably does about between 15,000, 20,000 steps a day, walking the dog. You know, she's she's really, really active, but she probably doesn't fuel sufficiently. And she's had um, reoccurring shingles four times in the last 12 months. So, uh, you know, I said to her, I don't think you're eating enough. And it's a really bizarre concept because I'm not sure that I realise the impact of, of that fueling for our immunity. So I've told her to put a bit more porridge into her into her breakfast every day and i just think it's 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 a link that not everybody would make so it's a really mm. interesting point yeah Perfect. i think that's something that's definitely come up a lot through this james I'm, i've got quite a few nutrition questions but i'm going to save them because i think that you might cover them but i'll just give you a couple of 
tips of what the questions about but i'm sure you get the yep. thing about things like actimel and you know like these yeah. superfoods and all those sorts of things so if there's any points that where they're relevant or not then bring them yeah. in whenever you like yes well again great timing jamie because thank you thank you the last the last aspect of this sort of resistance thread is is prebiotics now prebiotics are what these good bacteria in our gut feed on so it's not the actual bacteria themselves. We'll come on to those in a moment, but it's the actual things that these bacteria feed on. So again, another reason to eat plenty of fruit and veg, but the fiber which is in those fruit and veg, that is what those bacteria need to form this big, vibrant microbiome in our guts, which has a huge impact on our, our ability to resist getting ill. So again, some really good sources, obviously your fibrous fruit and veggies, plenty of variety, um, lots of starchy vegetables as well. Uh, you know, at this time of year, things like root vegetables are great. You know, your parsnips, your sweet potatoes, your swede, your, and various different starchy vegetables are great. They're also actually, honey can be can be quite a good prebiotic as well. So including that in your porridge in the morning, uh, that can be a good source as well because the, the sugar which is in the honey actually is a really good source of fuel for those bacteria. Beans and pulses are a brilliant one. So again, anyone who is vegetarian, vegan, another reason why to include lots and lots of beans and pulses and plant-based foods, but also your omnivores and, and carnivores, make sure you're including plenty of beans. You know, if that's making up some some homemade hummus or doing a big, you know, nice dish in the, you know, in the slow cooker, a stew, but putting in some beans, some lentils, things like that in there. They are fantastic for fueling that. But then also picking lots of good whole grain choices. So multi-grain, whole grain breads, pastas and also barley based sources so breads with barley and including those in again really good things the fiber in there is what the bacteria feed on so it means we can create this really great environment for those those good bacteria to thrive on in our guts so Emma, any particular foods in there which you're you sort of you, you know you make a point of including yeah all all of those um just to try and kind of fuel the fuel this winter training um but really interesting because i hadn't actually heard of the term prebiotic i definitely heard of probiotic but that's really interesting that actually the things that that i'm eating alongside other stuff is actually having a prebiotic effect so that's really useful yeah so yeah those two those two aspects so if, if we move on then into our more of our tolerance aspect of it the tolerance side of it is really is right we've we've been exposed to something what what things can we include that actually will ensure that any symptoms that we have are short-lived or that we can actually tolerate these these bacteria that we're infected with so actually as you mentioned probiotics being the actual bacteria that form that gut microbiome have a huge impact on our on our immune systems and our ability to to tolerate those so again it doesn't have to be in supplement supplement form it can be if it's easier and it's easy to take a high dose and if you are in and you have um, some antibiotics at some point during the winter months it is a good idea to make a real point about including these probiotic foods and potentially a supplement as well to regenerate and regrow that that gut microbiome as well so but again move those um points you made around actimels and yakults things like that anything which has got those live uh, bacteria in are fantastic additions into that and i think on the next slide we've got a few examples of those foods as well that we can include on so jamie if you just pop along to the next slide a second so yes these this is precise so probiotics are these good bacteria so yogurt natural yogurt is packed full of them all forms of yogurt have got plenty of this lactobacillus strain so greek yogurt skier yogurt natural yogurts but also some fermented dairy products like kefir which is very popular now you'll see it on supermarket shelves there are nice smoothie drinks which include it again really easy ways of, of, of including that you can have that at breakfast with your with your muesli at breakfast you could have it in a smoothie you can do plenty of different things with it um, but fermented foods are well are really good. Now, sometimes these these could be split split the audience a little bit, but things like fermented cabbages, so sauerkraut and kimchi, kimchi being often you'll you know you'll find it on the side of your plate if you're having say some fusion or Asian restaurant food, you might see some of that served with it, and you'll see it appear on menus as well, especially with Japanese food, Korean food as well. So these are fermented cabbages, so they have these strains of bacteria in them, and you can get them in quite high dose. But they go alongside things like pickled vegetables as well, are brilliant as well. You can add those into meals. And they I love a gherkin. Love a gherkin. <laughs> 
Perfect. Well, yeah, those 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 pickled yeah pickled veg fermented foods are fantastic. But also, if you're a big fan of, of sort of Japanese and Asian cuisine as well, things like miso soups are really good addition. So that's made from fermented soybeans, and you can make plenty of different varieties of soups and broths using those. Put lots of veggies in, put your noodles in, and have have that as a whole meal. And again, during the cold winter months, they could be really really good applications to that. So Emma, any of those? And you said you, you love a gherkin, but anything else? I love you, it. Yeah, I love a gherkin. Really um, there? <laughs> yeah, de well, definitely, definitely the the yogurt. Um, eat a huge amount of that. Um, I, I keep wanting to try. Um, the, is it? How do you pronounce it? Is it kefir? Yes. Yeah. Kef I yeah, think it's kef kefir. Kefir. Yeah. Kefir. Yeah. So I've, I've always wanted to try that, and I haven't quite branched out to that yet. So I need to add that to my list. Um, I'm not sure I would still have a wife if I ate too much sauerkraut, but I shall. I shall stick to, <laughs> stick to the yogurt. Love a stick gherkin. To the yogurt and the gherkin. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Again, yeah, there's lot there's lots of different yeah, there's loads of different ways of including it. But again, it's not um it, there's plenty of other ways in which you can supplement your diet with them as well. You know, there's plenty of of, of safe brands to use as well who do have progress. You can get lots of this sort of gummies as well now. Mm. Um so I would say that if you do end up having some antibiotics because of illness, it is a good a good policy once you finish those to try and really make the effort to either include plenty of these foods or a bit of a supplement over yeah. the next few months just to make sure that you, you bring those gut bacteria back up to the previous levels um, and they can be really really right. crucial yeah that's great um james can i the two two little points to ask if I yes may. one is this is probably a silly question but looking at things like kimchi and sauerkraut to an extent you always see them served in tiny portions how much do you need because it's always like a topping or a dressing yeah, you you probably need more than you get in a in a small mm. dish on the side. But but okay. again, it's one of these things. It's one of those elements. I think that anything is better than nothing. So if we include, you know, some of those, if they're not your favourite types of foods, then you're probably going to find two or three things that you can really hone in on that you really enjoy, and then it start to include those more and more. And I, I definitely find with a lot of the athletes I work with that yogurt and, and things like that including in smoothies and, and drinks is a really yeah. good safe option that they'll go for and actually miso is quite a quite a flexible thing you can make really good salad dressings with it you can make really good marinades for um, for fish you know you can do uh, white fish or salmon with a sort of miso and and honey marinade on which is really nice as well and making soups and broths with those sort of things as well they're, they're quite quick you know you can get sachets of miso paste add those into hot water or with a bit of chicken or vegetable stock chuck in your noodles, a protein choice, and you've got quite a quick meal, which is giving you some, some punch in terms of your immune system, but all the other nutrients that you need as well. So Perfect. yeah, there's, there's definitely, definitely there's common ones that people will enjoy and some yeah. people will keep, keep some at arm's it's, length. So. It's nice that you can accumulate them from different places. And yeah. then just um, to clarify something, because I think this is really interesting. Are we saying that you've obviously spoken a lot here about gut health and looking after pre and probiotics. Is that because the, um, not going to get terminology right here necessarily but the disease fighting good bacteria that keeps you healthy and away from disease and infection is that sort of born in the gut is that the, where the connection is or because obviously is there basically is there a link between gut health and immunity level yeah so so what what it seems to be is that that having a varied and high population microbiome so quite a lot of bacteria there but also good variety seems to be linked to our ability to tolerate um, the exposure to some of these bugs so it has an effect upon it's, it's labeled as being tolerogenic so the ability to tolerate exposure seems to be more uh, more impressive when you've got a healthier gut and that your microbiome is more diverse and, and well populated so it's not going to necessarily magically stop you getting ill but it, it will contribute to the ability of your immune system to reduce the time in which you may feel unwell or that you may have symptoms for so that's that's why it sits more in that tolerance camp than Wow. out and out resistance to getting sick so sure. that's yeah that's um, how that one what i works. really enjoy about working with you is, is when i ask a silly question you're always really nice about forgiving you the right i don't think answer. that's a silly question i mean that was a good question <laughs> no oh, thanks Emma. i'll a, take it yeah. Yeah. 100%. I think, so james i listened to a, a podcast and it was about gut health and, I, and it all, it's all making a bit more sense now hearing your um your clever bits about the probiotics <laughs> but it was talking about and again, this would go back to your point about sleep in that our gut needs a certain number of hours to rest and repair overnight. And therefore, if we are, for example, eating our eating our evening meal between, I don't know, 8 and 9 p.m., 
our gut isn't going to be resting, having done all of its processing and sorting out of all the food, it isn't going to be properly resting and ready to be to be regenerating until about two o'clock in the morning. So if we're then getting up at six, it hasn't had enough time to complete that process. And it, it basically was advocating eating as early, eating your evening meal as early as you possibly can, because then your your gut is is having the proper amount of time to regenerate. And I guess that is to do with the bacteria and and some of these bits as well. But I think that makes that makes a lot of sense now. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's and it's it, it's the resistance that it um sorry the so the, its ability its ability to help with this tolerance. Like you say, if you if you have a large meal close to bed, obviously it takes a long time to digest, and potentially if it's very high in high in fat as well, that will delay the digestion even further. So that's why late in the evening we want to probably avoid some of those higher fat, really high large volume meals because it's going to disrupt our dis digestion and it, it may disrupt our sleep in turn. And I think with the gut, the, the way to look at it as well is that it kind of, it reinforces that that natural barrier that we have in our gut. So as things are being absorbed through our system, the, the gut barrier is also a really effective weapon in our, in our immune arsenal, if you like. So doing, making sure of that, but also the way in which those, those bacteria metabolize, they form certain byproducts, which again, Act against pathogens entering entering the gut. So not only is it trying to trying to promote this sort of solid barrier against infection, but it's also trying to produce. It will also, if it's healthy and varied, it will produce lots of metabolites, which will stop necessarily pathogens and bugs managing to actually take hold and start to start to trigger off a, a, a significant immune response, if you like. So, yeah, so I interesting, think, isn't it? So interesting. Yeah, and definitely with athletes, they you know they they do find that this 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 is. The reason why it's, it's we do promote it with athletes, but I don't see any reason why. And again, it's found its way into everyday athletes as well. It, it can have such a profound effect on our ability to tolerate these bugs that yeah. it should be something that we think about. And it doesn't have to be supplemented. It can be from food first, and we can get a lot of these things just in our normal varied varied diet. So it's it is a useful way of doing it. Um, actually, Jamie, if you pop back a couple of slides and just go back to the uh, brilliant. Yes, sir. So the last couple of things. Yeah, perfect. The last couple of things in terms of how we reduce time out or, or days lost or days where we don't feel 100 percent is, again, vitamin D is a hugely crucial nutrient, which which we should be um, supplementing with during the winter months. I think it's very difficult to meet the needs that we have from diet alone. So you can get some in, you know, in, in eggs, in oily fish, there are the, in mushrooms, there are foods which do have a relatively high amount, but actually being able to meet the kind of guideline of a thousand international units every day, which we should all be getting, is very, very tough. You've got to eat a lot of mushrooms and oily fish. So, so generally speaking, it would be a, a universal kind of advisory to supplement with vitamin D during the winter months. And actually, we just don't get the, the wavelength of sunlight from kind of late September, October time, all the way through till March, April. So throughout those months, you just cannot produce vitamin D naturally by the skin as we should do. In where we are in the world, unfortunately, you know, we don't get enough sunlight and the right wavelength. So I'm guessing, Emma, that that's something that you would you would do throughout. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, just to reiterate that point, James, and hopefully give people a bit of a bit of insight. So as a as canoeists, we are outdoors probably I would say a lot more than than the yeah. average population, and we were all vitamin D tested about five years ago, um, and every single one of us was deficient. So every single one of us was below the required levels um, of vitamin D. And we are outside for huge chunks of the day all year round. So that was kind of like, oh, well, if we're deficient, then what's everyone else who's got, you know, who's got proper jobs? What are they, what, what they going to be like? So, yeah, absolutely. It is my absolute staple um, supplement that I would take every single day. Yeah, brilliant. And again, I'm not I'm not a huge advocate of telling people to take supplements, but this is the one exception is that everybody yeah. should take a supplement throughout the winter months because from an athlete's perspective, it has quite a profound effect on muscle recovery um, and and the ability for certain uh, certain hormones to, to work properly. But from an immune point of view, it's quite anti-inflammatory. So when we do have an immune response, it does have a positive effect on on the on the consequences of that immune response, and that's why it sits in that sort of tolerance 
area but again consistently taking it and again it's brilliant there's loads of ways of taking it you can have conventional tablets there are fantastic sprays you can get which you just spray uh, you know into the mouth or they do sort of little chewable gummies again which are fruit flavored if you don't like taking tablets but there's no there's no excuse really for not finding a way that in which you can take it so it's a, it's a quite a straightforward way of including that so again that's something like a really easy tip but by doing that consistently every day your levels will get to a, a point which which are which are promoting your ability to tolerate any any onslaughts with your immune system and the final the final one really again on that tolerance front again is just around if you do pick up any any symptoms is actually zinc is a really potent tolerogenic supplement as well so including foods which have you know, got plenty of zinc in some micronutrients like zinc are really rich in nuts and seeds but also in seafood and things like that but actually zinc lozenges which you can suck are really effective in terms of in terms of uh, decreasing the length of time that you have any symptoms for so if you have any kind of start of a little bit of scratchy throat a few cold symptoms by just sucking on on zinc um, lozenges a couple of times a day and potentially also vitamin c that can have a really nice effect and reduce the symptoms and the time in which you feel those symptoms for so that's a big thing that we we do use with athletes but again i think it's got application because as emma said really at the start it's not nice being ill <laughs> it's not it's not pleasant you want it you want to get on top of it as quick as possible and that's definitely something else but again you can include vitamin c rich foods you know things like oranges kiwis lots of peppers in stir fries and other dishes so you can get it from food as well but we can be really effective with that. So um, and um, is that something, something that you do as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I haven't done the zinc lo lozenge, but um, I could share with people my top tip for that moment where you get that scratchy throat. It may not make you popular at home, but I, as soon as I get any sort of feeling like that, I will get a pint glass and I will put um, a garlic clove, some slices of ginger, as much lemon as I can find from the fruit bowl in and fill it with hot water and drink as many pints of that hot water as I possibly can. And I'm I'm not sure it's got any scientific proof apart from the vitamin C, but it is, I think, an absolute game changer for, for not letting things develop um, into full-blown cold. Ah, I think it has got a bit of, I think there's, it's not something that which I've necessarily got any of the rugby players to do, which I, I spend most of my time working with. <laughs> As I'm sure that I'm not sure they'd be quite as, as happy, but I mean, obviously you've got some vitamin C in there, but also I think I'm pretty right saying that garlic also can help absorb things like zinc and, and other nutrients okay. as well. So, so I think there is probably a little bit of something there, but again, if it's something yeah. which you find helps, then absolutely it's it's going to be effective. And, it's probably, um, and maybe it's from the hydration as well, because you know it, you do end, you end up drinking quite a few pints, so you're getting more liquid yeah. into your body as well. So, yeah, yeah, Perfect. I think it's an interesting yeah. point as well that um, when you're at that point. Of illness you can still do things to not let it get too bad like I always yeah. think when I get to that point I'm like oh that's me done for I'm gonna be ill now but actually it's quite nice to know that there's things you can do still when you know you're getting ill yeah, yeah. just having having that reaction to things and and getting getting into those habits can mean that you are just reducing it doesn't mean you're suddenly going to be 100% the following day, but it's definitely going to reduce the time you feel some of those symptoms so again sure. by including some of those vitamin c rich foods and potentially zinc rich or using some of those zinc products you can reduce those symptoms as well so again for those people who are you know challenging themselves busy at work but they're also trying to accomplish some really hard training during these winter months as well it's it's going to be you know it's not going to be uncommon for you to experience some of those symptoms so how you react to them can have a really positive effect and it should be said as well that the kind of rule of thumb we would follow would be you know if you do have what we describe as any below the neck symptoms so any you know any sickness symptoms things like that we'd obviously recommend you're not going and doing really vigorous exercise because yeah. that's not going to promote with that and i think you know if you've got small cold symptoms sometimes not training with too much intensity but still doing some exercise can actually help you improve and feel better but if you've got any below the neck symptoms that's where we definitely advise yeah. athletes and everyday athletes to just say right i'll park that session for today i'll get myself right i'll do some of these things and i can go and do that session in a couple of days time so Amazing. yeah that's definitely the recommendation i don't know what they say to you emma i'm sure canoeing though they're, yeah it's they're exactly that canoeing. above above neck above neck below neck it's exactly that so yeah. Amazing. Am I heading to the last slide now, James? Right? Yes, I think so. Just just as a bit of a, of a, of a bit of a wrap up, really. And I'm sure we can answer a few questions as well. But yeah. I think the way to think about this is, like you said, 
boosting your immune system in some kind of super physiological way is unfortunately is a bit of a myth and the way we need to approach immunity is we need to try and maximize our ability to be resistant to getting ill and by following some of those tips and those those elements that we've talked about hopefully we can help you do that but then the plain fact is we're going to experience exposure to a lot of these bugs and bacteria and viruses throughout the winter and by doing some of these other aspects looking after our gut health with plenty of probiotics supplementing with some vitamin d and actually also being reactive to our time knowing when to train when to not and looking after ourselves we can also be really tolerant you know tolerable and sorry tolerant to these these bugs as well so those those two arms of it we can fight it on two fronts and get the most out of the winter with our training and our, and our, and our life in general as well amazing james i think um i've written loads of notes down but the main one for me like vitamin d and zinc i didn't realize how important they were but i think that's if it, whatever people took from that, there's so much there that we can all be doing. And Emma, we have got a couple of pre-registered questions, but I'm going to throw something in there off script because I think you're interesting me and I'd like to know. It's a personal question. Maybe other people are interested. I hope they are. Um, following like a social media trend, you know, you see these things, which is like a day in the life. I'd love to know what a day in the life for you is. And I guess, you know, you don't have to go too much detail, but like activities and nutrition, like what's your... What's your yeah. habits and, you know, what does a day look like for you? I think it, it depends a bit on the time of year. So we are in winter um, from about the end of September through to March. And then we start racing in April. So we're in kind of the race season then. So there's a bit of a switch up. But in the winter, it's, it is incredibly, incredibly brutal and incredibly dull. It's literally you you know, up, like I said before, starting the day right with hydration and, and fueling with, with porridge. I tend to I tend to eat the same things because I feel like I know I know what I'm getting from them. So I don't mind having the same diet. Some of my teammates couldn't do that. They want to have something different every day. So I tend to always start with, you know, big porridge, making sure that I've got that. And then we'll have a, a, a morning session. And then the gap in between that and the next session is filled with refueling, getting warm if it's as cold as it is today um trying to get some recovery so in that moment i will try and get horizontal um which is why i think i think people think athletes are terribly lazy because we do spend some of the day lying down but i will try and get horizontal just to get out my wheelchair and, and try and get some better recovery um and then and then we go again for another session and then it's that refueling after it and then in the summer when we're probably doing some higher intensity work i will look a bit more about fueling for that specific session so there might be some pre-fueling or some in-session fueling as well um but i do think that my staples as i've got older as an athlete my my staples of bedtime sleep hydration and and that that whole hygiene piece i think has been my savior because it, mm. if it, an athlete of my stage was was losing days to to, to infections and an illness i wouldn't be in the position that i am so I think it's Amazing. just sticking to those really clear, yeah. useful bits. The fundamentals, and no, I think that's brilliant. And James, we've got a couple of questions. I think we've covered a lot already, but a um, couple of ones which may be a, a slightly more niche. But first question, you've obviously mentioned about supplements. Um, so we, as, again, like you said, we don't necessarily always recommend them. But you always will talk about a food first approach, which of course we do, but vitamin D being one that you probably don't want to compromise and maybe vitamin C as well. How do you choose what a good supplement is like what should you be looking for because you can go into a supermarket you can see four different ones one's one pound and one's 10 pounds so what are we looking out for to ensure it's good quality that is a great question um absolutely i think so that mantra is i would say it's food first but it's not food only when there is a circumstance where you can't get enough of something from food reasonably then you have a choice to make and that's where again vitamin d is a great example because we would we would recommend that that is something that people take i think the big question is you want to have confidence that you know what is in the supplement so after athletes we very much work around so they have um, strict drug testing policies. They want to know that any supplement which they take has been batch tested to ensure that what is in the product is what it says on the label and that there are no other nasties in there which could cause failed drugs tests. Now, for your everyday athlete, they might not have the same um, awareness around drug testing, obviously, but for safety around actually knowing what is in the product and, and, and making sure there's nothing else in there, there's also that element. So looking for supplements which might carry the Informed Sport logo or even for everyday athletes, they now have something called Informed Choice, which is where the company registers the product 
with an independent independent testing body and they will be they will attach uh, they will batch test uh, different batches throughout the year and they can carry that logo so that gives you a bit more reassurance that, that the product is what it says it is and that it hasn't got anything else in there so that would probably be my my recommendation i think there is as as much as um there are brands which are targeted at, at general population every day if they are if they're pharmaceutical so i'm going off on one now if they're pharmaceutical and they're made to they're made to the standards of um pharmaceutical drugs which are very few and far between but then they have to have what they say on the tin. If they are a dietary supplement, then I'd probably advise people to still go with a brand who does carry the informed sport or informed choice logo. Okay. So they have a bit more reassurance over the processes and the manufacturing processes. But th there are several brands out there which which yeah. you can get uh, online or things. But I would I would look for things to have that reassurance, just even, even though you're not tested necessarily, um, it's still a good way of approaching it, I think. Amazing. I think that's perfect. And then the final question I'm going to ask you both, but in slightly different ways, if that's OK. So, James, um, from your perspective, how have you got any advice or when you're working with players for how they might be able to spot signs of um, vitamin or mineral deficiencies? So like if they're not quite getting what they need from their nutrition, is there anything they should look out for? And then the question to you, Emma, which is similar but slightly different, is is there any ways in which you're you feel where you think maybe I'm not quite getting what I need from my nutrition or my body is fighting something. So yeah, James, if I go to you first, like what are you looking out for from an external perspective? And then Emma, I guess from an internal perspective. Um, I think uh, being aware that when you see athletes or uh, people who just generally do seem to pick up bugs more often. So if they do lose more days to sickness, that would be a big flag that we'll, we'll make sure we spend some time with that athlete and try and get to get to the bottom of why that might be. You'll also get athletes who will complain of disturbed sleep. So if you're finding that you're you know waking up repeated, repeatedly in the night, if you're not sleeping consistently well, that might might be down to, you know, overtraining under fueling or, or, or other elements of, it, of your health and well-being and then I suppose the last one is if they're complaining of any gut symptoms as well so if you're if you're getting um, you know any gut symptoms and you're having potentially um, sort of transient allergies to certain things where you just might not be tolerating certain foods very well that will also be another bit of a flag that we might go and investigate a bit further and just check the status of some of their some of their micronutrients and, and just make sure that they're getting everything they need. Perfect and Emma how about you what do, what do you look out for? I think I think for me because I'm quite I'm quite lucky that this is my job so I get to do the sessions and, and know my food that I need for those sessions my biggest flag is probably around sleep so we have to log our our health status every single morning with how much sleep we've had what quality of sleep we've had and I think although we have to do it as part of our our training it's not a bad technique for everyone to have a bit of an eye on you know how much sleep did I get last night and was it okay because I feel like if I have two days or two nights where there's been an abnormal sleep pattern for my usual um, it will be a bit of a flag to think right okay I want to get a nap in or I want to boost some extra you know really good immunity foods um, and things like that, just to try and 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 be just be aware. I think it's an awareness thing, Jamie. Of am I a bit more vulnerable? Okay, so yeah. what can I do about it? Yeah, no, I love that. And my um, technology also does that for you now. Like my Garmin, when I wake up in the morning, gives yeah. me a sleep report. I'm getting obsessed with it because yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I want the best possible start to the day. Um, both it's been so fascinating both to hear the insights and how you live the life but also James there's so much information in there and I know there's some really key takeaways from people and the, the overarching thing theme that I get from this is we all have a role in looking after ourselves and if we do that we have a role in looking after other people as well because there's nothing worse than when you go into an office environment and someone's not very well and you think that's coming at me so if you look after yeah. yourself you can look yeah. after people so yeah. don't even do it for yourself just do it for other people as well um it's always amazing to spend time with you both and listen to all of your advice and insights so thanks so much for joining us today thanks jamie thanks james i learned loads yeah pleasure it's great to see you both You're a pro. and for everyone watching i hope this has been interesting and is enjoyable for you um please do join us again for future events wherever you're watching from please do give us some feedback if you head over to our youtube channel there's a full catalog of content there like, subscribe, comment, share, do all the things that people are supposed to do. And hopefully we'll see you at the next one. But in the meantime, take care and have a great day.